is the future of our data rights and the internet. How should we regard privacy in a future crypto and potentially cashless society? And what's all at stake in a Web3 world? Welcome to Word on the Block, the series that takes a deeper dive into blockchain and the emerging technologies that shape our world at the intersection of business, politics, and economy. It's what we cover right here on Forecast News. I'm Forecast News Editor-in-Chief Angie Lau. Well, the Department of Justice has announced that the FBI has successfully recovered millions of Bitcoin dollars from the colonial pipeline ransomware hackers. In early May, a cyber attack forced the company to halt operations, pay the hackers known as dark side five million US dollars worth of crypto. Now the US Justice Department says it has successfully recovered 2.3 million in Bitcoin and that news actually sent crypto market plunging. What does this mean for crypto as a medium for illicit activities? What does it mean for privacy? What does it mean for tracking? We'll discuss all of that and more with today's guest. She is the general counsel of Protocol Labs, special counsel at Electronic Frontier Foundation, chair of the Filecoin Foundation, and one of blockchain's most prominent legal voices today. Please welcome to the show, Marta Belcher. Marta, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me, Angie. I'm so excited to be here. I, I'm excited to have you on because there's so much to talk about. But, you know, let's let's talk about um, that first topic here. You know, it's really top of mind for people. Uh, currently, we are experiencing a little bit of a crypto pullback in terms of Bitcoin and other uh, coin prices. Um, and certainly, you know, this big hacking uh, uh, event uh, that was followed up by uh, ransom of Bitcoins and then subsequently the recovery that the FBI was able to conduct, uh, that, that has kind of caused really consternation in the market. What is the greater impact here of all of those events? Well, I think, first of all, I think it's, it's, it's hard to tell uh, what causes you know, what causes price fluctuations in cryptocurrency markets, uh, they can be uh, pretty volatile. And it, it's hard to, it's hard to say, you know, correlation here definitely is not necessarily causation. But I, I do think that this case is a great example of why Bitcoin is not a good tool for criminals. You know, the authorities have been able to quickly recover this Bitcoin. Uh, and, you know, we don't know the details of how, but this really underscores that a technology where all transactions are permanently and publicly recorded on a ledger is not actually that great of a tool for crime. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, it's a pretty common refrain for critics of crypto to say that cryptocurrency facilitates crime. But notably, criminals have used cash for quite a long time uh, to commit crimes, and we don't call for a ban for cash as a result. And similarly, I just don't think it makes sense to blame the technology. Um, you know, we don't blame Ford when one of its cars is used as a getaway vehicle in a bank robbery. Um, and so here, I think it's a, I think it's a great counterexample um, for folks who, who, who say that cryptocurrency facilitates crime. And, and certainly that really is starting to debunk um, what a lot of even central bankers, uh, everyone from, uh, you know, uh, Christine Lagarde uh, over in Europe and top voices, uh, you know, across the spectrum of regulatory bodies, they all point to the same thing, that there is a terrorism aspect to it. But help us understand a little bit more if there is an ability for us to track uh, very publicly traced transactions on blockchain. Um, why continue that, that line of criticism when clearly the FBI has even proven that there is an ability to recover a lot of that back? Yeah, I mean, it sort of is, a, I think, in some ways, a, a fundal, fundamental misunderstanding of, of the technology. Um, you know, I, I, I really think um, people don't realize that Bitcoin is is not anonymous. It's pseudonymous. Um, and, and you're having um, a, a public key recorded permanently on a ledger forever. Um, and, and anyone can see that. The authorities can see that. Um, and uh, in some ways, it's a it's a shortcut, I think, for uh 
for law enforcement. And so, you know, I'm, I'm very, I'm very um, glad that this was the outcome, that there is a very quick recovery of Bitcoin for, um, you know, after this, this ransomware attack, which was, of course, awful. And and you know th- that is the the that is the the one obvious aspect, and then the other obvious aspect is the counter to that. Well, if it's so easily be easily traced, why would I value it as a cryptocurrency? Why would I value it as something that I want to have in my wallet? What's your view on potentially this making people a, 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 a many people nervous about the traceability of cr- crypto? So I actually am a, I, I do think that actually one of the most important things about cryptocurrency is the ability for for some cryptocurrencies for the tech not the underlying technology to enable you to take the anonymity of cash and import it to the online world. Now Bitcoin is pseudonymous, but there are privacy coins out there, um, and I think that from a civil liberties perspective, this is an incredibly important technology. Um, I like to. Uh, think about this photo that I saw uh, from the Hong Kong protests. And there are these photos where there are these long lines at the subway stations because the protesters wanted to buy their train tickets using cash because they didn't want their electronic purchases to place them at the scene of the protest. And to me, that really underscores that a cashless society is a surveillance society and the importance of certain technologies that can enable anonymous transactions. And so I do think that's um, from a civil liberties perspective, why privacy coins in particular are so important. And, and what do you think that in your view, what role does blockchain and cryptocurrencies play in, in preserving the privacy for, for citizens? It, it, tell us a little bit more about that technology. Do you think that we're going to start seeing more trends in privacy coins or privacy tokens? Well, unfortunately, what we've actually seen recently is a trend where the U.S. government and other other governments around the world have actually been pushing to take the uh, to take the surveillance that happens in the traditional financial system and to extend it to cryptocurrency. So we've actually seen the government pushing back on the ability of people to make anonymous transactions and to transact anonymously using cryptocurrency. Um, you know, we've seen them, um, for exa- just as one example, in the Department of Justice crypto enforcement framework that, that came out recently. Uh, they created this acronym called Anonymity Enhanced Cryptocurrencies, um, i.e. privacy coins, um, and have been arguing that, that, that just using these is evidence of uh, potentially committing crimes, which I think is absolutely uh, not fair. I think that it's utterly important that to understand that financial transactions uh, being anonymous does not mean that necessarily that these transactions are, are illicit. And unfortunately, we've come to just accept in the traditional banking system and the traditional financial system that so many of our transactions are frankly turned over to the government by default without a warrant. Um, And we're seeing that increasingly pushed onto cryptocurrency. Um, So it's definitely a place where there's a lot of friction right now um, and uh, an area where I'm really concerned for our civil liberties. And, and what's the pushback? I mean, what, 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 what do we need to consider um, as we really kind of sit at the apex of, of this issue? Well, I think that there are some very important, I think there are some very important fundamental questions about, about civil liberties. Um, You know, one of the, one of the issues, one of the things I've seen repeatedly is there are some cryptocurrency advocates who say, well, look, as long as we're just being regulated the same way as, um, as, as the traditional financial system, that's fine. We're not going to push back beyond that. Um, And for me, that's really concerning because for whatever reason, we all seem to have just accepted that banks turn over our financial transactions to the government without a warrant en masse in in a system of mass surveillance. Um, and, And in my view, that is actually unconstitutional. And so we're really getting to, I think we're really getting to a place where, you know, zooming out, um, we really need to think about our values, not just in the 
cryptocurrency space, but also when it relate as it relates to all financial transactions. You know, we increasingly are talking about the central bank backed digital dollar here in Asia. China is light years ahead, um, to be specific, seven years ahead, uh, multiple trials in place. Um, we're seeing rollout uh, and impact and influence across Asia as other nations are also embracing uh, and exploring a CBDC. We're starting to hear that uh, from even Jerome Powell over at the Federal Reserve in the United States, uh, exploring what a um, you know a CBDC could potentially look like. There's uh, the Digital Dollar Foundation and all the rest. But when we talk about CBDCs, you know, one big thing that that is a concern for a lot of people is uh, tracking, right? The ability for uh, a country to track every transaction and potentially um, control it, uh, uh, encourage you to spend it in one way, discourage you or ban you from spending it in another what about the surveillance capability of uh, blockchain technology in a digital currency? Um, how should we regard that? And what are the concerns you have there? You know, honestly, I think CBDCs, uh, personally, I, I find this terrifying from a civil liberties perspective. Um, you know, I, 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 as I've already said, I think back to those Hong Kong protest pictures and, and really thinking about um, what it would mean if there was no option for those protesters to buy those subway tickets with cash? What if they only had the option of purchasing something with, that is traceable by the government? How would that change their behavior? I don't think you would have seen those protests, right? Or or they would have had to walk home, right? Um, but I, I think that people um, really need to understand that financial transactions are a window deep into someone's life, deep into their politics, deep into what they're doing, their location, um, and that these types of transactions are incredibly sensitive. Um, and so I'm very concerned about the idea of all money being digitally administered by a government. And so then what's the, what's the option? I mean, that's, that's kind of where we're all going. Well, it's an interesting question. Um, I mean, so so Brian Brooks, who's the former comptroller of the currency, um, uh, just recently was commenting that, that he really didn't see this as something that was in line with the way that Americans do things. You know, it's sort of like we don't rely on our government necessarily for these types of innovations. It's almost like going back to um, the post office banking system. Um, so, you know, I don't know. I think I think uh, reasonable minds can differ about the future of CBDCs um, and whether they are actually um, whether that's actually where we're headed. Um, and you know, certainly, in my view, reasonable minds can can differ about whether that's a good thing. So back to the surveillance aspect, if cryptocurrencies also have an aspect of surveillance, if CBDCs has some aspect of surveillance, where can we as the individual feel safe, safe from a privacy point of view, um, transacting in the future? You know, a lot of that is going to depend on the policies that are being made right now. So we, we actually had coming out of the very end of the Trump administration, um, there was an attempt to shove through um, uh, FinCEN, uh, Department of the Treasury, tried to shove through a regu regulatory proposal that um, really would have extended this type of surveillance uh, to cryptocurrency um, and made many of, of our cryptocurrency transactions um, uh, visible to the government by default. And now that is still... Um, pending review. We've also seen similar proposals recently, um, for example, um, internationally uh, from Thaddeus. Um, and and it's really it's really all a, a common a common theme of you know of of pushing the financial surveillance of the traditional banking system um, on to cryptocurrency. Um, and and unfortunately, um, that's a battle that. That's a battle that's uh, that's being waged right now. So I think I think it really really depends on 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 our policy efforts. You know, I, I recently talked to uh, Christian Carlo. He is the head of the Digital Dollar Foundation uh, on a previous episode of Word on the Block. Um, and one thing that I thought was really interesting that he brought up about CBDCs is that uh, he viewed it more as a contest rather than the race. That um, you know. As different nations kind of 
start promoting and projecting their version of CBDCs, that CBDC can take on the characteristic of that nation. And so, you know, what is the agenda? What is the monetary policy? What are the constitutional uh, values even that uh, potentially an American digital dollar might have in contrast to what we might see from Japan, what we might see from uh, Indonesia, what we might see from China, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, do you think that there could come a day where we could actually have a choice in the same way that we have a choice to either deal in U.S. dollars or deal in, you know, local currency of choice where, you know, it's liquid internally in the country, less liquid externally? Well, I mean, I think we do have a choice right now and we have yeah. the choice of whether to use U.S. dollars or whether to use Bitcoin or whether to use Ethereum or rather, you know, I think that's one of the most exciting things about cryptocurrency is that suddenly it's not just about which government do you think is the least likely to fail in the near future, um, but it's actually um, it's actually about um, uh, it goes beyond particular uh, geopolitics and and it, it th this is the thing that's so great about crypto cryptocurrency is is going beyond borders um, and and so you know do we do we need to have yet another um, <laughs> yet another currency that's tied to to geopolitics I don't know um, but I do know that we have a lot of great uh, we have a, a lot of great cryptocurrencies uh, to choose from now that's that's a great way of putting it I mean you're absolutely right when we Think about monetary uh, fiat right now, the, the, the actual cash. There's so much connected to it beyond just a transaction between individuals. There's trade policies involved. There's foreign policy involved. There's geopolitics involved. And with cryptocurrency, there seems to be use cases involved. There are values involved. You know, one's a privacy coin. This, you know, I'll even use, uh, you know, IPFS in, in what you're doing at the Filecoin Foundation. Uh, this is a token that represents, uh, uh, you know, a decentralized store storage uh, concept of, of, of being the backbone of uh, Web3. And there's value there. Um, you know, it's almost like instead of having to choose the clubs countrywise, we can now choose sub clubs that are more, you know, value driven, industry driven, um, more, more you know, more transactionally driven. I, I think that's a really interesting evolution of what we're talking about here. I com I completely agree. I completely agree. And I think I think it's so powerful as well, not not just that you have um, these cryptocurrencies um, tied to to particular use cases, but but also the fact that inherent to those to many of those cryptocurrencies, certainly with Filecoin, is is the ability to program your money and the ability to to I, I think that's really the thing that's revolutionary um, about cryptocurrencies um, is being able to write computer programs um, that automatically execute um, on on particular transactions. You know, um, for in in the case of Filecoin, uh, you know. As it automatically compensating people for for storing your files, um, I think that's that's the thing that makes this particular uh, technology so powerful. Uh, this is a this is, it's a perfect segue to what I want to talk to you about next. I mean, we are a, a, a day into what we experienced, uh, which is mass internet outages reported around the world. Websites like CNN, The Guardian, New York Times, Twitch, Pinterest, Reddit, Spotify, Amazon. I mean, the list went on and on and on. Even the UK government website went down. Um, you know, what do these outages say about the safety of our assets, our finances, our access to something that, you know, drives our day to day? Um, <laughs> I'm curious how, you know, you thought about that and, and how the foundation thought about that uh, when you take a look at how centralized attacks tore down these sites and what a decentralized system might have uh, enabled us to continue to do. Just curious yeah. your reaction. 
Absolutely. I mean, I think it's the the best possible example of the importance of um, the decentralized web. Um, you know, the fact that so much of the internet uh, is controlled by just a few corporations, um, and and so much so much of the web is 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 stored and can be taken down um, because of it being stored by centralized intermediaries. Um, and and I think the thing that is you know, this is a great example of of why it is so important and so powerful to have an alternative to that centralized model, um, where instead of instead of having a model um, where where everything is in in one place, and in order to retrieve a website, I'm going, you know, getting something from a, across the world, um, where instead there can be um, many copies of that website, and I can just retrieve the one that's closest to me. Um, I think I think there really could not be a better um, there really could not be a better example of of why it's so important for us to decentralize the web and have that that architecture as an option. And and that you know and and to just kind of expand that into the world of DeFi decentralized finance. You know we often talk about uh, tracing uh, trackability, et cetera, et cetera. Well, in DeFi. There's no KYC. There's no AML. There's there's no central point of of access, um, and it is an enormous place where we're watching innovation thrive alongside, unfortunately, really bad actors. Alongside immense opportunities. Alongside all of you know the issues that come up when you're trying to settle uh, the wild wild west. Um, is that a challenge? Is is DeFi, in your view, a, a challenge as it contributes um, to to what potentially could be the future? Is it a solution or is it a problem? Well, I want to go back. I think to the concept of being able to program your money, right? I think fundamentally, what a lot of this technology boils down to is giving you the ability to transact with others directly via a computer program without any central intermediary sitting in between um, and and the ability for you to really just interact with others similar to the way you interact with someone when you hand them a twenty dollar bill um, and 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 the thing about DeFi right is that that you know in its in its sort of boiled down uh, fundamental state um, you don't have intermediaries you really have, what you have is, is really individuals interacting with each other. Um, and I certainly have a lot of concerns about um, the way that, that we think about regulating transactions with other people when the thing that we are thinking about regulating is actually computer code, right? Um, I think this actually is a, a, a really um, sticky area. Um, we've already seen some instances where regulators are making statements that are frankly just uh, anathema to the First Amendment when they're talking about the way that they might be regulating this computer code. And we just have to remember, I think, that that when you're talking about DeFi and you're talking about these types of regulations, fundamentally what you're talking about is code. And so wh what does that code support, right? I mean, and and how is that code protected, right? Back to the point of, does it reflect the constitutional values, uh, which it can be challenged in a court of law, which is, you know, why we're super interested in talking with you and or, you know, in other nations where it's it's not as clear as to where individual rights actually fall. Yeah, I mean, I think I think that one of the things that's so um, that's that's sort of unique to 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 the American Constitution um, is uh, the First Amendment and this concept that computer code is in fact speech. And I think this is so, so important. Um, and so when, when regulators are thinking about the way they're engaging with DeFi, I think it's really important that they aren't writing regulations or, or bringing enforcements that is going after people for, for merely writing code, right? So, Obviously, there are many things folks can do that that ought to be illegal. That you know that that are you know that that ought to be regulated. But it's very easy, I think, to latch on to 
well, okay, when, well, what did they do wrong? Well, they wrote this code, right? And it's just so, so important, I think, that that's not what regulators do, that they take a more nuanced approach and that when they're talking about the things that they want to regulate, it's not the writing of the code, it's, it's other behaviors. Yeah, but we've, also, we've often seen that when those interests conflict, uh, you know, innovation gets bigfooted by, by um, you know, the greater good. Uh, and I'm curious what your thoughts are on DeFi. Do you think if DeFi challenges the adoption of CBDCs, DeFi is also going to be in the crosshairs? Yeah, I mean, I think I am, I am frankly deeply concerned about uh, the ways in which regulation in this space um, has hampered innovation. I am deeply concerned by the gray area that many innovators in this space um, are left in, particularly in the United States. Um, you know, many innovators have left the United States um, in, in the cryptocurrency space, and um, and 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 that's, in my view, not a not a good outcome. You know, I think it's really important to have regulatory clarity, um, to not have um, issues of uh, uh, gray areas persisting around very important legal questions um, and, and having those questions only answered by scattershot enforcement action. Um, I, I think that's, that's not a good way to regulate. And I am, I am deeply, deeply concerned um, about the ability for, for uh, innovators to, to continue to innovate. It, and yet, and yet in this industry, we, we see that innovation thrive. Uh, it's, it's, it's interesting to see, uh, as we've covered this space uh, for the past few years, that there is a, a really interesting dance almost, you know, where innovation thrives, it's supported until it reaches almost, a, a, it, it breaches tolerance or it, you know, the, the, something, something happens and then there's a little bit of a clampdown. And then there's a whack-a-mole effect where, sure, you could clamp it down here and it pops up somewhere else. Um, I want to talk about the innovation called NFT. Uh, <laughs> this, this, is, this is just really fascinating space. It has evolved even beyond uh, and starting to, at least on the creative kind of industry. What are the legal challenges um, that you're experiencing right now um, over at Protocol Labs and IPFS when it comes to, to NFTs? Well, um, you know, it's actually, it, it, with regards to IPFS and NFTs in particular, I, I would call it much more of an opportunity. Um, you know, I think one of the things, you know, we were talking about the issues with the centralized web. And I think one of the issues with NFTs is, you know, you want to be able to make sure that this thing that you're buying, that you're spending all this money on, um, is actually going to persist into the future. You know, you want to make sure that it's it's going to be around, even if whatever company it was, you know, that was that was hosting the server goes out of business. You want it to be around, you know, a hundred years from now. You don't want just want it to be around five years from now. Um, and so, for that reason, it really doesn't make sense to store NFTs on the traditional web. You just can't count on NFTs still being there in X amount of time. Um, and so it's one of the uh, one of the one of the big use cases right now um, for IPFS is, you know, it, it, people say right now, if it's not an IPFS, it's not your NFT. Um, and, and really, um, that's what we're seeing is 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 this this real appetite for NFTs to be stored on the decentralized web. Do you think about that? I mean, we are hearing about that's that we've heard that as well. Um, in terms of if it's if you can't ultimately have uh, a guarantee that this is going to exist forever in a decentralized uh, way, that you know at some point that's not your your NFT. It's also been reported that that artists have found that their artworks have been downloaded online, sold as NFTs by other people. What happens if that? happens in IPFS. Um, do you do you think about that legality and, and how you know and, and and how you would respond as as a platform, as a protocol, or you know, how, how should people how should people be regarding that? How do you think about it legally? 
So I think there are two, I think that actually, there are actually sort of, there are sort of two separate questions embedded in that question. The first is just sort of the, the copyright question, right? Uh, around, you know, there are so many interesting um, intellectual property issues that are coming up in this space. And then I think the second is, is really a, just a generally a content moderation question, like how we think about content moderation on the decentralized web. Um, so I could jump into either of those, but I, 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 I guess I'll give a, a high level of both. Um, so, so on the on the sort of copyright side of things, I I think I think there's just a massive opportunity right now um, for people to do um, uh, NFTs and licensing right, um, and to really make sure that um, when you are making an NFT of something, you're taking into consideration. Okay, when someone buys this NFT, are they also receiving a license? Are they also actually getting copyright to the the underlying artwork? You know, these are questions that are not uh, are often overlooked, and they're really important questions. And also, bigger picture, zooming out, I think it's really important, in my view, to keep keep, keep considering openly licensing things, right? So continue to like when you're when you have an NFT. The fact that you're selling an NFT of something doesn't mean that you can't also mandate that the underlying work is 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 continued to be licensed under Creative Commons, for example. So mm -hmm. that's sort of the intellectual property side of things. But I think underlying that question was this question about content moderation on the decentralized web. Like, it, you know, it, it, how do we deal with content moderation issues? Um, and the, the answer to that is actually um, uh, there's this fantastic uh, organization called Murmuration Labs uh, that we are working with. Um, and it's led by Alex Fierst, who is a uh, leading person in the um, content moderation area uh, and the former head of trust and safety and general counsel of Medium. And they are building tools for content moderation on the decentralized web. And the idea is that you know, it's not one central intermediary. It's not uh, Facebook or Google or one individual company that's making decisions about content moderation, but rather that these content moderation decisions can be made at a node by node level um, or a gateway by gateway level. Um, and and, and basically taking content moderation and scaling it in a way that, that works for Web3. Um, and so I'm really excited, uh, really excited about these these tools and and the abilities uh, that they um, that they enable and the, this this new concept of decentralized content moderation. And and as we wrap it up, uh, you know, what two two questions? What keeps you up at night when <laughs> when you when you think about all of all of the things that that we face at the moment, and then end it off with an optimistic note. What, what gets you jumping out of bed every day? So those two things. Oh my gosh, those are great questions. Oh my gosh, what keeps me up at night? I mean, honest, like just to be super honest, the answer is like, what doesn't keep me up at night? <laughs> um, I mean, like, like in the cryptocurrency space, um, unfortunately there is so much regulatory uncertainty just in general. Um, and and I, I really, I, it, it is real. Like I think for, for innovators, um, the 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 fear that comes from regulatory uncertainty is 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 definitely um, problematic, you know. And I, I'm very concerned for innovators in this space, and and very concerned about um, all of the all of the policy proposals that we're seeing, um, you know. And 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 I talked already about the 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 push for financial surveillance to be extended to, to to cryptocurrencies and to have this warrantless mass surveillance in the crypto space and 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 I'm this is a this is such a trend it's such a pattern and it is um it is getting worse and worse more and more traction and um it's 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 hard to stop uh frankly and so that is definitely <laughs> that is definitely what's keeping me up at night um what gets me out of bed in the morning um so I tr I truly believe that that Filecoin is the uh, incentive layer on top of the decentralized web. Um, I think the decentralized web uh, has so much potential uh, and I'm so, so excited to, to be building um, a, what I think is potentially a fundamental piece of it. Um, I think it's such a cool technology and I, honestly, I'm, I'm so excited every day to, to get to work on it um, and, and, and just beyond delighted to, to be the board chair of this, this organization at the Filecoin Foundation. So that's, that's the more positive note. 
<laughs> I love it. I, I truly believe that it's it's these legal voices in our industry that actually do help translate uh, beyond the technology layer um, a an impact layer uh, to regulators um, as it pertains to the law um, and defend uh, against a lot of criticism and misperceptions, which I hope that we helped kind of debunk today. Uh, Marta, with your help, I think we did uh, do our part today at least. Uh, Marta Velcher, thank you so much for joining us on this latest episode of Word on the Block. It was a pleasure having you. Angie, thank you so much for having me. This was, this was great. And thank you, everyone, for joining us on this latest episode. I'm Angie Lau, Editor-in-Chief of Forecast News. Until the next time.